Okay, I think we can make okay. a start, yeah. So welcome and good evening to everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome our government partners, um, our academic partners, our private sector partners, our industry partners. It's wonderful to have everybody here. And as I said, every time we have another event, we see a, a greater, richer and deeper number of people joining our conversations, which is really exciting. Um, I'd like to um, welcome uh, in particular any new members to the forum this evening and we very much uh, look forward to working with you in the future. I was just mentioning uh, in our kind of green room chat earlier that uh, the British Blockchain Association is very proud uh, of its global reach and obviously having established or helping to establish the Blockchain Associations Forum, we are now connecting with, uh, I'm not sure what the last number of, of nations is, Dr. Nassim, how many nations uh, internationally is the? We have 48. 48 nations and growing. So we it's, it's an exciting time and everything we do, we offer great value to our members, but we also offer great value to our industry partners. So today I'd like to just briefly talk you through some of the initiatives that we have coming up that you may be interested to either participate in or to learn more about. Um, my introduction is reasonably, um, it, it's an overview, but if you want any more details, you can contact me at Deborah at BritishBlockchainAssociation.org. Um, or uh, you can you can kind of get in contact with info at and we'll get back to you. The first opportunity I'd like to discuss this evening is obviously our journal. Uh, we have the journal of the British Blockchain Association, as you all know, that is a uh, academic and industry journal with some of the most insightful and critically acclaimed blockchain articles globally. The articles are reviewed by a distinguished panel uh, of, of editors from leading entities globally as well. And our next issue is coming up. There is an opportunity to sponsor uh, the cover and get involved in the issue. The deadline for the submission of uh, expression of interest will be the 5th of October. So if anybody would like any more details on that, please get in contact with us. Also, we are looking to um, invite organizations to participate in the UK's National Blockchain Roadmap. Um, this is a very, very interesting report that has been compiled, collated and delivered uh, between the, block, uh, the British Blockchain Association's uh, government and private sector. There are going to be, um, we obviously have various different speciality subgroups that we would like to engage with. Um, and, you know, just to give you an idea, we have research and education, you know, governance, um, very, you know, emerging technology, citizens and public services. We have a number of different subgroups. So if you or any members of your team would like to engage with us and start to participate as part with, you know, in the development and evolution of the national blockchain roadmap, we'd be delighted to hear from you. This is an opportunity which is only available to BBA members only. Um, but if this was something of interest to you and you were interested in maybe becoming one of our members and getting involved in an initiative, which I think it's safe to say is really guiding, um, guiding a leading industry into the future, uh, we would be very happy to work with you and, and share some information on that initiative. We would also like to reach out to our international partners just to let you know that the um, International Scientific Conference in 2022 is going to be happening in March. And we are now looking for research abstracts uh, for submission in advance of that event. Um, Dr. Nassim will talk a little bit more about that event uh, as part of his presentation later, but I'm just flagging that this is an internal deadline for uh, research abstracts and the deadline for submission is the 15th of November. We will be having a forum meeting between now and that deadline. So we will remind you in the October session and talk a little bit more about that in the October session. But just to let you know, this is an amazing opportunity for your work, your research, your technology insights and foresights um, to be presented to an extremely influential um, group. And the ISC 2022 event will be online and we expect it to have one of the largest attendances um, to date based on um, provisional interest. So that's the update from me now. Um, I'd like to hand you over to uh, Dr. Nassim and I look forward to listening to today's forum and also to speaking to you again over the coming weeks. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Um, this was uh, excellent. And I welcome all of you to the forum. So I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, uh, I promise that I will talk about evidence frameworks uh, and some of the standards uh, setting that's been um, taking place in the blockchain space. So um, if, if you have built a blockchain or a crypto or product, or you are working on something that you believe is uh, hugely beneficial to the society, and has the potential to create a big impact, then at some point in your product roadmap, uh, you may be asked to present your work to policymakers, to public services, someone in the government, or you may wish to apply for some of the funding grants that are available uh, to uh, develop your ideas into uh, products, into projects. And at that stage, <clears throat> you must be prepared to um, undergo a very rigorous review. And that process uh, can take many different shapes and forms. And I want to touch very briefly on that. That process can start from a review of uh, your research uh, thesis, your idea, your presentation. Uh, it can take the form of a peer review of your grant application, uh, a peer review of your project, uh, a review of the societal impact that your, your, your project has, has created and so on. So everything is going to be uh, evaluated. Now, you might say that, okay, I don't want anyone to review my work, but I want to, I want you to check out this message from uh, UK Research and Innovation. Um, this is, those of you who do not live in the UK or <clears throat> not familiar with the UK's uh, public funding system, uh, UKRI or UK Research and Innovation is the, the largest public funder of research and innovation in the UK. And it is working under BEIS, B -E -I -S, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of the Government of UK. And it has got an annual um, allocation of eight billion pounds per year to UKRI. And I want you to focus on the last three lines, which I think are very, very, very important. Every pound of taxpayers' money wisely to maximize impact. So what, what the message here is that your work is going to be reviewed, it is going to be assessed, it is going to be evaluated before any amount of public money is given to you for your blockchain project or, or, or any technology project. So I think that is very important to, to understand. Now, if you are a university in the UK, you will receive government funding uh, for your research based on three things. The peer reviewed outputs that you have produced, the research outputs, articles, research papers, the impact of your intervention. This can be a societal impact, could be academic impact, but mostly the focus these days is on societal impact and also the research environment. So what's important here is that if you have, if the government has hundred pounds of funds, then 60 pounds. So the 60% of the funding is allocated to the universities based on peer reviewed research papers that they have produced. So once there is enough evidence, so that once there is enough evidence for something for your work, then the next step is how confident are we in recommending your project to, to public services? Uh, so next step is the recommendation. So there are two, so it's a two part process. One is the collection of evidence and then the recommendation. 
because what are we going to do with the evidence? Are we going to dismiss the evidence? We are going to make some recommendations based on, 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 the, on the evidence. So how confident are we in recommending your, your project or your idea to the citizens, to general public, to society is based on how strong the evidence is. And I would highly recommend if you have not done so already is to check out the, the UK's blockchain roadmap um, uh, on the use of taxonomy and the terms that, uh, that we have uh, proposed. So weak evidence means there is weak recommendation. If you're not sure about a project, you're not going to say this is a fantastic project and an and idea and research, and I'm going to be using it for millions of people in my country. You're probably going to say, well, I'm not too sure. I think there is a risk of bias. I think there is conflicting evidence. I'm not too sure. So I think the higher the quality of evidence is, the more confident the policymakers are in recommending your work to the uh, to, to public services and, and use the taxpayers' money for your implementation of your project. So um, on a similar note, uh, that's, that's, that's it from me. Um, I would like to invite um, the next, next speakers who are folks who have not only published really novel research papers uh, in the field, but they, they are also um, externally peer reviewed papers. And I would like to say they are, they are very much evidence-based practitioners. So, <clears throat> Uh, I, will, I will hand over to uh, my uh, uh, other speakers here. Is, um, <clears throat> is Rob here? Yeah, Rob is joining. Um, I think Daniel is here. So Daniel, would you like to go ahead, please? Yes, of course. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here uh, this uh, evening with you. And um, uh, it, was, it has been an exciting journey and it's been also an honor to be uh, accepted and published by the British Blockchain Association uh, Journal, um, along with uh, Giselle Waters, which uh, I believe she's also here at the Zoom, which is uh, quite a, 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 good, a good surprise as well. So uh, yeah, I'll be just uh, very brief as well. Uh, just wanted to share a little bit uh, of, the, of the details about how we ended up, um, uh, you know, like uh, public, uh, making this publication and what, what, is, the, what is the story behind uh, this uh, concept, right? Uh, if, if that would be uh, an okay agenda for, for you guys. Um, I, I don't know, anybody hears me well? Everything's Yes, okay? we can hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect, perfect. So um, in my story, I believe everything begins or begins in terms of blockchain. In 2014, I was uh, hearing um, for the first time about blockchain in, uh, in the Singularity University. And um, it was Peter Diamandis in, that, uh, in, 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 a, in a class that they were talking about uh, blockchain technology. So my background is in cybersecurity and I was fascinated about uh, this uh, paradigm shift because I used to work for Sun Microsystems in my past uh, professional life. And we used to install very big servers, right? It was like the, I believe the, the, uh, the summit of the centralization, right? It was super big uh, servers, $3 million server with maybe, uh, you know, a lot of CPUs and so on and so forth. But, um, just fast forward, and I got involved in 2015 in at least uh, eight projects um, involving blockchain technology, mainly in the fintech space. The, I believe the one that I really like uh, from that era is, is Saldo, Saldo.mx. 
Uh, saldo, which is the translation of balance in Spanish, um, started to use a stellar network to not, um, not for remittances, but to pay for invoices uh, from the United States uh, immigrants, Mexican immigrants in the United States to their families. So with this wallet, uh, it was the first time in the history there was a crypto peso, a crypto Mexican peso that can be holded or, or was, uh, yeah, it's, it can be held by the Mexican immigrants in the United States. And this uh, wallet uh, is used to pay for utilities, for groceries, for taxes and so on and so forth. So this, this project is still there um, helping, uh, I believe 50,000 immigrants in the in the United States. Um, so in this way, people don't have to uh, send the money. They just uh, need to. They just uh, take care of of all the, the expenses, right? The basic expenses. So uh, a little bit forward in two thousand seventeen, um, my son was diagnosed, uh, unfortunately, with uh, a rare disease. We got an accident and uh, he was 18 months old. And uh, we discovered that he had a mutation in his 17 chromosome. So my wife and I obviously received the, the news uh, with a lot of ignorance. We didn't know what a rare disease was. Uh, of course, we did know about Men Mendelian um, diseases, but... Um, but yeah, it was a, an unpleasant surprise. It, it turns out that I am the carrier of a gene and my wife is a carrier of a gene. We are, uh, well, it, it is not expressed in, in us, but it was expressed in our, our uh, fourth kid. So um, thank God he's okay. He's a super happy boy. We just have to be very careful about um, if he gets caught or something, he can bleed a lot because he's very similar to hemophilia, but it's not uh, hemophilia. And um, I believe the, the collateral beauty about that, if there, there was one, is that um, I got pretty, pretty involved in how the DNA information uh, of, of my son and, and everybody, everybody else is transmitted, uh, stored, and basically the governance, right? And so in, in 2017, in December 2017, the concept of a genetic wallet or a genomic wallet was born, at least inside my head. And I started visiting Stanford University. I have a, I had a, 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 well, I still have a very good friends there and started like interviewing um, many professors. And then in finally, in 2018, we launched the company called Ginovang.io, which is still uh, right now our, our current project. And uh, since then, we, uh, we saw in the NFTs, spe specifically in the ERC721, uh, the, the baseline to uh, represent um, DNA data and more specifically the mutations uh, or the, the personal mutations of every human being. We can remember very briefly that our DNA has uh, almost, uh, well, more than 3 billion letters, more than 3 billion bases, but 99.9% .9 of our DNA is we, we share it, right? Uh, it's, we are the same species, we are the humans. But that, that 0.01%, which is about 5 million letters, 5 million bases are unique, right? And that is what makes us non-fungible actually, <laughs> or different from one another. So um, in, the, in that information, we inspired uh, to, to create this, um, uh, this paper, 
which I, uh, I, I, I had the great honor to, to uh, share with Giselle Waters. And uh, she, I mean, we, we worked uh, like six months, I believe, or seven or six months in the paper. And we got super excited when we received it. So I'll be more than happy to share the, the link of, of the paper that it's resulted because it combines, at the end of the day, it combines three uh, super important uh, disciplines or areas of study, which is privacy laws, uh, genomic data, and non-fungible tokens. And actually that is exactly the name of the article. So we try to, uh, well, it's a little bit long, <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, uh, let me see if I can share it with um, everybody. Um, but anyhow, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to, to share it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that it is uh, publicable later. So after this um, paper or article was published, we also uh, were honored with an award um, as well from the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. We are very, very uh, grateful with Dr. Nassim and all the team because we won the, the, the award for the best application of blockchain or the best article, sorry, in life sciences. And since then, we've been interacting with a lot of laboratories uh, around the world and with, with the two products, uh, we have uh, a saliva tooth, basically, that is used to extract uh, DNA that, can, that is represented by an NFT. Uh, so we believe this is the beginning of uh, biosamples, human biosamples being traced, stored, and on own control, and in, in, in general terms, tokenized as non-fungible tokens. So the, the patient, which we believe is the true owner of the biosample can uh, you know, remain engaged with its biosample and see who has a copy of it uh, in terms of the digital data or where this biosample is stored and so on and so forth. And we have another uh, product that is uh, a privacy preserving uh, COVID-19 certificate um, that is mainly used to for, by travelers, right? Or people who wants to go to a conference or a restaurant. And these are uh, really controversial right now. And we, we believe that the, you, this is a, a new world in, in terms that we need to um, show what is the current status. But the good thing about blockchain is that uh, it, it helps us to create these certificates without keeping a copy of the personal data of the patients. Uh, so our technology, how it is designed, it doesn't break the confidentiality between the patient and the laboratory because we treat all the data encrypted. And this, that is basically what um, we are doing today and uh, we're being used by laboratories all over the world. We have uh, customers in Nigeria, in Lagos, we have in Miami, in Mexico, Colombia, uh, Spain, now recently uh, been joined also by Pablo Lopez. He's also here. Uh, thank you for being here, Pablo, as well. He's uh, right now uh, our, our main business developer uh, um, in, in Spain. So it's, it's been a great journey. And, uh, and again, thank you for having me and if there may, may be a, a, some question or, or, or if there's a, a space for, for questions or comments, I'll be more than, than happy to be here. Thank you very much, Daniel. So, so questions we'll take in the end. We have some kind okay. of dedicated kind of 10, 15 minutes uh, um, uh, time allocated for that. So that, that, was, that was excellent. Uh, well done. Um, Thank so you very we much. We have uh, next speaker with us, Professor Rob Campbell. Uh, Rob has joined us from America and he is the editor of our cryptography section. And I can say that he's probably an expert in, in quantum computing, quantum cryptography. He's a chair of quantum computing in his university. So 
the reason I we invited him is to give us a very brief overview of what exactly is a quantum quantum attack on, on blockchain. We keep hearing it all the time, and and how do enterprises uh, and governments prepare for such an attack? And he, he he has published three papers now in the JBBA, and I think he's published many more. So uh, over to you, uh, Rob. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, can thank you hear you. me well? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, th thank you. Thank you for the uh, warm introduction. Um, yes, I, I will go over those things, but very quickly before I uh, talk about a quantum computing attack, uh, just very quickly, what a quantum computer is. Um, <clears throat> our reality and our universe. Um, it doesn't work the way that we've been told and the way that we've been taught. And what I mean by that is that our universe that we live in and our reality is quantized, meaning that everything is energy. Uh, everything has uh, discrete states. So we take advantage of, of these principles to create a quantum computer. And there are three main principles that we, we capture to make a quantum computer work. One is called entanglement, meaning that particles uh, or energy uh, is entangled in a way, such a way that if you make uh, a change or an impact on one particle or energy packet, that it would be instantaneously felt no matter the distance. So the speed of light goes out of the window. So for example, uh, a particle that, that exists in our galaxy uh, the other particle be a, could be an Andromeda galaxy, and that um, that uh, change would be felt instantaneously. So speed of light uh, is out of the window when we're talking about quantum mechanics. There's no such thing. Um, the other principle, another principle is called superposition, meaning that uh, our reality is not what we think it is. So for example, everything is quantized, everything is energy, everything vibrates, everything moves and in, in and out of our reality. So for example, we are here half of the time in this universe and half of the time we're in somewhere else. So we know that this happens at trillions times per second, trillions times per second. We're here and then we're not here. So between the time that we're not here, that's called a quantum gap, a quantum gap. And in the quantum gap, we have all possibilities, we have all probabilities. So that's a very interesting topic, uh, but I won't have time to go in de detail about that. So we use uh, entanglement, we use superposition, and uh, another principle you may have heard about is called the uncertainty principle. So if we know that where we are precisely, then we cannot know uh, exactly where are the momentum uh, what the energy would be. So that we have infinite amounts of energy available to us. We can go in any direction. So uncertainty principle plays in, in this as well. So to, to wrap up what a quantum computer is and why it's such uh, a drastic uh, departure from what we have and what we call today is classical computers. Classical computer uses a transistor, a uh, binary code, Something is either there or it is not. If it is there, then it could be a one. If it's not, then it could be a zero. And that's it. There's no shades, no nuances uh, in between. Now, if, if you have a problem that uh, requires nuance, then you need to add more transparency. Rob, you, we can't hear you properly. You, something with your uh, mic. Yeah, that, that's better. Better. yeah, that's okay. better. Yeah, that's better. All right. So, so what, what I was saying is, you know, what makes a quantum computer uh, superior over a classical computer is the way that we use the laws of the universe to measure reality. So, uh, classical computers use transistors. It is either a one or a zero. That is binary. Quantum computers use a quantum bit, which means that that bit is an atom, it's an electron, it could be a molecule. It means that it's entangled. So it uses the laws of the universe, angled um, uh, circuits. And so that mirrors reality. That's like what we are. We're going in, we're going out of this universe. Everything is going in and out of this universe. So that is why a quantum computer can do 
uh, things that a classical computer cannot because uh, we're using the physical laws of the universe to measure reality as opposed to just a one and a zero and a classical computer. So uh, I know this, you know, it's a kind of a maybe not included topic, but uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I would just wanted to very briefly go over what a quantum computer is. So now I'll get into the next topic is uh, what's going on with quantum computers. Um, we have a rapid uh, development uh, globally in quantum computers. Some you hear about, some you don't. Uh, of course, uh, you know, governments know that this is one of the most important technologies of our century. And therefore, they're not going to tell you <laughs> uh, all of their secrets about what they're doing with quantum computers. But what we do hear about is what's published, what's, what you hear about on the internet, what we see in the journals. And uh, China recently uh, published a paper on a quantum computer um, that surpasses IBM, surpasses Google. So supposedly it's the world's fastest commercial quantum computer. But you know, they're government computers and they're not gonna talk about those. Um, so the reason why uh, this is such an important topic is because these computers are able to capture all secrets of, of a nation, all secrets of individuals. So for example, you have an intellectual property you want to protect. You have government trade secrets. You have government communication. Uh, you've got uh, the plans for, uh, for a, a new economy. All of these things are exposed with uh, a quantum computer on the scene. And so therefore, there's been an international effort to uh, mitigate these quantum computing attacks. And so NIST has been, along with some European agencies, have been working on uh, standards. So next year, we are expecting standards to be uh, published. 2022-2023 uh, timeframe is the best estimate next year. And what what the impact is, is tremendous and is not well understood because these new uh, algorithms that will be standardized, they will not function, they will not work in today's networks, in today's enterprises uh, at all. So major, major changes must be made. And this is not well understood yet. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it's causing, a, it will cause a major disruption. So the government, enterprises, everyone must prepare now. And how do you prepare for this? First of all, uh, you have to understand today's crypto cryptography. What, how, is it, how does it work? How doesn't it work? Also, you have to understand what is the new post-quantum cryptography that is about to be standardized? How does it work? How doesn't it work? And how can we integrate the two? It will most likely have to be a hybrid mixture of classical cryptography and post-quantum cryptography in order to make it work in, in most cases. So we're going to need a workforce that understands cryptography we have today. We're going to need a workforce that understands post-quantum cryptography. We're also going to need a workforce that understands quantum mechanics because quantum cryptography is a whole nother subject. And it doesn't use mathematics like we do today. It uses quantum mechanics, but it's very, very promising type of cryptography that is uh, resistant to quantum computer attacks. So uh, these are the things that I see on the horizon and it's happening now. Uh, I've been working uh, in cryptography since 1987. And, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, changes come and they're coming fast. And so uh, I think it's a major, major disruption that we are probably not prepared for, uh, but we need to uh, start now. We need plans, we need the, the, the studies, we need to get all of this in place uh, now. So that's kind of a very quick introduction uh, into quantum computing. Uh, what I see uh, coming on the horizon. And uh, with that, I, I pass it on back to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Excellent presentation as always. And I think um, our members and, and blockchain professionals would be very interested to
to hear more from you in future, especially when the standards are out. So, I mean, ideally before uh, to prepare and make the necessary changes. But as you said, you know, the hybrid um, classical quantum and post quantum, I think the important thing is to get the education now and then prepare what necessary changes are required. So that was fascinating presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, uh, our colleague, our friend, Manuela from, uh, from Portugal, Lisbon. Um, Manuela, I remember meeting her in 2018, I think it was three, four years ago in London. And she's a, she's a very lovely lady and been with the Department for International Trade and British Embassy for, for a number of years. And she's very kindly agreed to uh, have a chat with us about what's happening in, in, in Portugal, um, in, especially in the blockchain space and also businesses. We have had many chats with her over the years about you know, how to support businesses and uh, enterprises that are interested in exploring blockchain and distributed ledgers and, and so much is happening. So uh, over to you, Manuela, and uh, thank you for, for joining us again. Thank you. Dr. Nazim, it's a pleasure being here today and uh, I thank you for the kind invitation and I must say um, to our lovely audience that all the compliments that Dr. Nazim paid me are completely reciprocal. Um, I can only say good things about the collaboration with the British Blockchain Association and it's true, we met for the first time in 2018 at the, at the Blockchain Week in London. So, um, as, as Dr. Nazim already referred, uh, I work for the Department for International Trade at the British Embassy in Lisbon. And for the ones that are not familiar with what we do, uh, I would like to explain that we are um, a British governmental department. And our aim is to support the UK companies to export and to grow overseas. We also help um, foreign companies to set up in the UK and to grow their businesses in the UK. Uh, our services are free of charge and we, we exist to support UK companies. So please don't hesitate to contact us either directly or through the, through the British Blockchain Association. And this department is overseen by the recently appointed Secretary of State for International Trade, uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, and we, we supply our services in over 100 markets internationally. So um, whatever is the market that you are interested in, you will have uh, support from people that speak the language, that are based at the British uh, Embassy, and that are there to support you grow in the market. Um, nevertheless, I would also advise you to visit our website, which is www.great.gov.uk, where you can find all kinds of support from, um, from reports about the markets that you are interested in, uh, how to start exporting, uh, how to apply for, um, for financial support to attend trade fairs, uh, and even the contacts of international trade advisors, uh, I mean, uh, teams that can support you locally uh, near where you are based. So uh, it's very important that you keep in touch with us before you enter the markets because we can save you time and money and we can support you entering without all the hustle of uh, um, hiring um, accountants and lawyers and we can give you all this initial support for free. So uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about our partnership with uh, the British Blockchain Association. As, uh, as I referred, we, we met for the first time in 2018. Uh, still in 2018, we facil facilitated the, the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the British blockchain and the, the Portuguese blockchain alliance in order to, to enhance and promote more activities between uh, the UK and Portugal in terms of blockchain. Um, we also invited the British Blockchain Association to participate in the Portugal Digital Summit, and uh, it was a brilliant presentation by Mrs. Michelle Shivunga. Uh, and in 2019, um, DIT and the Portuguese Association of Blockchain and Cryptocurrency um, 
went together to the to the blockchain week in London. So it was the other way around, taking Portuguese participants to to the UK uh, to promote the expertise from from the the British companies. And uh, still in 2019, we also organized our first event on fintech and blockchain. It was organized in Oporto, in the north of Portugal, and it was under the theme a glance at the British Portuguese interconnections in fintech and blockchain. Apart from that, the IT has been working on an ongoing uh, basis with uh, blockchain companies, British blockchain companies that are based in Portugal, namely uh, VACT, Applied Blockchain, and Dorai, part of Ethel Partners. And obviously, we will be delighted to support other UK companies that have an interest in the Portuguese market. We can find you partners, we can organize events for you. So any kind of support that you need, just share with us. And within our limits and our remit, we will do everything to support you. Um, I confess that with the pandemic, we have to postpone our, all our face-to-face -face events. So sadly, we were not able to organize face-to-face um, -face events during this one year and a half, but we are now resuming our activities, our face-to-face -face events, and uh, we have the intention of organizing uh, an event in the next uh, first quarter of 2022. Um, and obviously we'll be hoping to, to count with the presence of the British Blockchain Association and also the Portuguese Association of uh, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency. And by speaking of uh, association of um, um, the Portuguese Association of uh, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency, I have here today the, the great pleasure of um, introducing you to Mr. Fred Antunes. He is the chairman of the Portuguese Association for Blockchain and Cryptocurrency. He really is an expert on this subject. And I confess that as a DIT member, quite often I go to him for advice and counseling on this very topical subject. And uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Fred Antunes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It is always a pleasure to collaborate with the DIT and of course, in such a great event of the British Blockchain Association. In fact, I've been also in, in the London Blockchain Week, um, as, uh, as Manuela uh, spoke about it. Um, is it possible to share uh, my screen uh, with you? Because regarding to the whole picture, yeah, sounds perfect. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazim. So uh, the Portuguese Blockchain and Cryptocurrencies Association was founded uh, back to 2015. Um, where we really identified um, a huge need of uh, regulation uh, for the whole industry to grow. And back to 2015, our work was much more harder than what it is today at this stage. So uh, I'm going to share my screen just to uh, speak about two things in Portugal. The first one, the regulation from the Bank of Portugal, the Portuguese regulator, and the second side, what is going on with the Portuguese tax authority, because both of them, they will reflect the rules where all the companies who want to grow in Portugal, they can, they can operate. So uh, I'm going to share my screen um, with the website. Okay, so um, I'm sharing right now the, the website of the Portuguese Bank of Portugal. And since September of 2020, the Bank of Portugal became the exclusive regulator of everything that happens with digital assets and, of course, blockchain technology. Um, and our association was really in touch much before, uh, before this regulation. Uh, this regulation was a natural consequence of the implementation of uh, the AML5 European Directive. Um, and there was also a public consultation where all the players in Portugal had the opportunity to contribute to, to the law, in fact. And um, our involvement was really deep into the scene, especially explaining the regulator um, what are the benefits of the blockchain technology, how will they change uh, our 
way of life, in fact, and uh, how could the regulator regulate the sector, but at the same time not block the innovation. So one of the challenges is that the regulation, the regulators in all Europe or eventually in the whole world have has is how can we do this? How can we regulate the sector, but at the same time do not block the innovation? And our participation in uh, regular meetings uh, with, uh, with the regulator was exactly to, to help to increase the awareness, explaining not only the benefits, but also the risks, and how could we build an ecosystem in Portugal that could help us to grow in a very sustainable and in a very solid way, not only in the long, in not only in the short term, but also in the medium and long term. So since September of 2020, um, the regulation was published. Today, we have already three companies uh, licensed by the Portuguese Bank of Portugal to operate. And I think by the end of the year, there will be uh, five or six more. And one very important, we will have the first uh, Portuguese bank with a crypto license uh, to operate uh, digital assets uh, in Portugal, which I think which is, is a great, um, is a great uh, improvement in the Portuguese ecosystem, and especially when the banks, they are also um, implementing and requesting this kind of uh, license. Regarding to the, um, to the Portuguese tax authority, which is something also very important. We have uh, monthly meetings um, and multiple conferences where not only where we, we try to explain to the Portuguese tax authority how, do can, how do they can benefit from the implementation of blockchain technology, which would facilitate a lot of um, the, the tax authority performance, but also in the same way, how the companies can um, can can grow once again, and at the same time they can pay their taxes and and be hundred percent compliant with the Portuguese tax law. And I don't have any uh, English uh, written article. Uh, everything is in Portugal is in Portuguese, but um, there is a. Um, uh, an article from Forbes that uh, I wanted to share with you that the Portuguese tax authority clarified how the companies in Portugal can grow and how does this work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that convert Portugal in a very attractive country for, for blockchain industry, and of course the whole digital industry at the same time, is um, the tax environment that we have today. So compared to some other countries in Europe and even around the world, besides we have already um, legislation for a company to acquire a license. Uh, it's very clear today how the taxes work. So um, regarding to VAT, I think it's something very, very simple. Um, it's an exchange of currency, so you don't need to, 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 to take care about it. But still, when you want to, to deploy um, a token or any tokenization pro process, even with the non-fungible tokens, um, it's, it's very clear how you should pay taxes and uh, how you can operate. So, of course, there is a lot to develop. And I think for the next two, three years, the Portuguese tax authority uh, is going to move forward a lot, and especially the legislation itself. But what we have today if we mix up Bank of Portugal and Portuguese tax authority, I would say that in 2021, the whole ecosystem is ready to grow uh, and of course enables the possibility for multiple companies to, to rise in Portugal. Um, also, I would like to share one of the startup initiatives that um, uh, are, are being deployed here in Portugal, the Block Start. Blockstart is a program uh, to help blockchain and DLT startups and, of course, SMEs to, to, to deploy their solutions in the market. Um, and basically, Blockstart is, um, is an European program, but it was funded here in Portugal and is leaded by um, BrightPixel, which is um, a very well-known uh, incubator here in Portugal. 
and they have been doing an amazing job. So they support uh, the initial uh, costs of the company, of the new company. It is a program that uh, any Portuguese or eventually European company can, can apply. And they will support the development, they will support uh, the mentoring, and multiple companies are also already benefiting from this block start program. Uh, to move forward, of course, I cannot leave this presentation without sh sharing with you probably the four most important successful use cases of what we are doing in Portugal. Um, I think the biggest and most successful company using blockchain and of course digital assets uh, in Portugal is Utrust. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud that they are Portuguese because they have been doing a marvelous work in terms of facilitating the integration of uh, crypto payments inside uh, traditional payment methods. And today they are partners of Shopify and they are partners of more than 5,000 different uh, merchants online uh, facilitating uh, the payment processes and everything else. So they are a very, very successful use case about what Portuguese um, companies can do uh, and what Portuguese companies can, can scale up all over the world. Also, I want to speak about Real Fever. I'm the current CEO of Real Fever, but of course I would need to put this here, especially because you spoke about NFTs. In Real Fever, what we do is NFTs of football um, and uh, we are being very successful also. So basically what we do is we sell packs and with the packs, you can open moments of video all backed by intellectual property. And people is just crazy about trading the NFTs and, and everything else. So it's already working product that is already in the market. Um, Bruno Fernandes is the official ambassador, but much more are, are coming in. And of course, the company is scaling up for new sports, not only football um, and, and more verticals we will build over the horizontal technology that we already have. Um, also, Taikai, they announced a round of 2.2 million last week. Um, and basically, Taikai is 100% dedicated to innovation with new projects in blockchain. Um, so uh, their, their core business is directly connected to, to challenges and hackathons. And uh, they help multiple startups to build their own hackathon to find a solution over the community. And we'll, with this contribution, they can find out a better way to go to market and develop a project um, and, and, uh, and, of course, find out uh, the best possible solution to, to scale up. They are already partners of Nissan, Pfizer, Microsoft, so they have been doing a great job. So Taikai, um, I, I just put it here because uh, besides being close friends, um, they are also doing a, a marvelous job. And in the subject of uh, esports, of course, esports they are growing very, very fast. Um, and uh, Exceed Me is one of the Portuguese companies who is exploring this integration between, you know, League of Legends, FIFA, CS:GO, and at the same time um, enable the players. Uh, to, to monetize their content in a social media environment. And they are also being very, very successful as they are growing. And I do believe that esports and blockchain, they have so much things to do together in the future. And we are just about to start. So with, with these uh, all examples um, from the Bank of Portugal, Portuguese Tax Authority, Blockstart, Utrust, Real Fever, Taika and Exidme, I would say, that uh, the Portuguese ecosystem is very, very healthy, especially because we are a very small country, as you all know, but we are full of talent. And um, I would say, as the president of the Portuguese Blockchain Association, one of my main goals is to help. And that's why we have such a, a good relationship with the DIT, because I think we are 100% in the same journey which is to internationalize uh, the Portuguese companies, help British companies to grow in Portugal, share know-how, share expertise, because in the end, and just to finish, we are all in the same journey. Uh, we are in a really, really early adopt uh, stage at the moment. 
for the next 10 to 20 years, a lot of things will happen and will appear. Some of the things, something that we already don't know, but it's just based in the entrepreneurship uh, and collaboration that we will help all the ecosystem all over the world to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. This was excellent presentation. And um, yeah, I think a lot to learn uh, for uh, businesses, uh, enterprises, and the um, projects and communities in Portugal. So if they want to get involved, they become a member of the, the association or how do they, they get in touch with you? Yes, so they can visit blockchainportugal.pt, which is our official website. They have an email form and uh, whatever they need, they just need to, to, to contact us or eventually directly on LinkedIn um, with my profile or someone from my team. And uh, whatever they need, we try to help. Um, I think most of the requests, and that is an insight that I can share with, with, with the panel, is most of the companies, they're not looking for uh, tech support. Most of the companies, they are looking for regulation support. So because everybody um, in terms of technology, they can understand how they can build their products. But the question is always, are we compliant with the Portuguese law or not? And this is where we jump in and this is where we really help uh, the entrepreneurs uh, to move forward because besides um, we, we had the opportunity to participate in the regulations and we know what is written uh, we can guide uh, every single entrepreneur uh, to do the things properly to do the things as intended and fully compliant with the Portuguese regulators because if you do the things respecting the law your risks will be dramatically less. So that's why um, in the last six, seven, eight years, I've been always in touch with the regulators because without regulation, we cannot move forward. Yes, indeed. Yes, excellent. Um, okay, so any, if, any more questions? This is an open forum Q&A. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions to our panelists uh, about NFTs, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, quantum computing, uh, what's happening in Portugal or, or, or anything else, uh, feel free to post uh, in, the, in the chat box or just uh, raise your hand. And what, what we do in these, this is just kind of fun activity. We have, as Deborah mentioned, we have uh, our annual conference in, in March and we give one, one, one complimentary ticket to the participants. I've just been given lots of these chits so what I do is I, I invite one of our guests to, to pick so that we are not doing any cheating. Um, so I've got all these different chits with different names. So maybe Manuela, if I ask you, um, right hand or left hand? <laughs> I can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> left hand. <laughs> so you mean this one that I'm moving? Yes. This one that I'm moving, okay, right. Martin Guzman. Martin, if you are here. Okay. And by the way, the other yeah, chip, was, they're all different. The other chip was Mehdi Husseini. So Martin Guzman, you have won a, a complimentary ticket to IEC 2022. We'll be in touch with you. Um, okay. Thank you for joining. Okay, now there is a, there's a question from um, Neil, Neil Bose. How do you see DAOs going? Uh, Fred, decentralized autonomous organizations, is that a thing in, 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 in Portugal yet or are we still exploring? Uh, yes, um, I, I would say that DAOs will be, will be probably the biggest challenge ever for the legislators because the way that we build a company today and, and the type of rules that exist uh, to build a company today, they are not prepared at all uh, for a decentralized autonomous organization. And, and I would say the governance model. So um, we already have some conversations here in Portugal 
um, regarding to a DAO, it does not go to Bank of Portugal, not even to um, our uh, Stock Exchange Commission uh, regulator. So it goes to a completely different uh, uh, regulator that I would say that eventually does not even exist in Portugal today. Um, so th there is still a, a long road to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I tried to, to do a DAO myself back in 2017. And then I gave up because there was no lawyer in Portugal that could help me with that. So yeah. I think in terms of governance, for the future of companies, uh, a decentralized autonomous organization will be pretty much amazing. And uh, especially because the way that you can implement democracy and uh, decision uh, powers will empower the people that is around the DAO instead of having the traditional format of one CEO, one CFO, one CTO. So this idea about C-levels and then, you know, uh, a top-down um, governance will disappear to have a much more decentralized uh, governance distributed to all the players that will be part of it. But uh, I would say that Portugal, regarding to the DAOs, I think DAOs will be the next hype for 2022, 2023. So at the moment, we are surfing the NFTs hype, I would say, and we will do that until the end of the year, eventually beginning of 2022. But decentralized autonomous organizations will be the next biggest trend using blockchain technology. Uh, when we, it will start, we don't know yet. I think we will need probably two or three more years because we, there is one thing that we cannot uh, miss, which is for you to implement a DAO, we need to have our mindset ready for a decentralized governance. And that is not easy, especially when you have to deal with shareholders and sometimes you have to deal with investors and the investors, they have their needs, they have their exit uh, strategies. And when you build and you implement a DAO, even the funding and the investment in the company will come in a different, completely, in a completely different perspective. So everything will change when we move forward for a decentralized autonomous organization. So I think we will need two, three more years, but uh, I hope to be part of it because it's a pleasure to witness, you know, all the, the developments and all the possible use cases that blockchain technology can enable. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, I think what we need is some clarity on the governance structure of DAOs, uh, how it is going to work out and also stakeholders need to be very clear because obviously we have worked in centralized systems and centralized governance models. And I think we need more research. We need more standards and frameworks on, on how it is going to work. But I think it's a very exciting, exciting area. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one last question. I think Rob on, answered that if, if I remember correctly, do we have any expectations? This is from Mehdi. Do we have any expectations about when the quantum computing will be out to public? To public, Rob, are you here? Oh. Can you take this question quickly? I think is he asking about like yeah. as in like um, for public, like for for a home yeah. user when it will be out? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, already uh, quantum computers are available. Uh, IBM, uh, Honeywell, you can log in to. Uh, these sites and you can start using quantum computing. There are others as well. They're already available uh, for use. Uh, they have uh, courses that teach. IBM has a really good program. Uh, Honeywell is new on the scene, but Honeywell, uh, they're saying basically they're expecting to be one of the first on the market with uh, desktops. But I don't know, that's what they claim. I don't know how much is marketing and how much is technical. But to answer your question, they're already available in which you can uh, go online and use them. But Honeywell is one of the leading ones uh, as far as uh, getting them into the public's hands. And so that timeline is probably within a few years. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, OK, I think if you have no more questions, I would like to thank our our, our participants, panelists, um, Danielle, Fred, Manuela, Rob, um, Deborah, everybody. 
Uh, this session was recorded, so the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. If you want to share with your network, with your colleagues, um, uh, you, you are more than welcome to do so. So we'll see you next month. And um, please do share these, these forums. They are free to attend with your colleagues and networks uh, uh, in, in, in all parts of the world. So thank you very much to all speakers, and uh, uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. It was thank great you. to be here. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.